while we are waiting, uh, maybe I, I will I will start to, to introduce you. So I'm I'm pleased to welcome today uh, John Ioannidis. Uh, he will talk about epidemiology of uh, infectious disease model, and um, so please, uh, it's time to talk now, right? Thank you very much, Pierre. It's a great pleasure to uh, join your, your webinar series and uh, apologies for last time that my transit while traveling did not work. Right. So um, some thoughts about infectious disease model uh, meta epidemiology. Models have a very long tradition of successful or at least insightful applications in infectious diseases as much as in any other field in biomedicine. Uh, for example, SIR models have been out there for almost a century. It can be very useful conceptually with diverse, interesting applications and with a broadening spectrum. They can use a mixture of data speculation assumptions, and there can be challenges both with data and with speculations and assumptions. They have acquired tremendous prominence during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, com completely out of proportion compared to their role that they had prior to 2020. It was a crash test for models, and I think a crash test for science at large, and I think that they were used by both highly specialized and well-trained people and by others who jumped into the fray, trying to contribute well-intentioned, but with no training either in mathematical modeling or in, in the uh, specific uh, uh, subject matter field. There are long-standing issues with modeling that became more manifest under the new expedient and high visibility circumstances. And my team that is interested in studying research as a, an object of scientific study uh, found that as an opportunity to do uh, work of meta-epidemiology, of, of assessing the way that research practices around models, mathematical models work, specifically infectious diseases, and of course, in the setting of COVID-19 that was so prominent. Um, just to give you a sense of, of how much things changed in the last three years, um, this is um, an analysis that we looked at what happened just within a year or a little bit over a year of uh, the, the pandemic being uh, proclaimed, we have 720,000 scientists publishing scientific papers on COVID-19. This is completely unprecedented. And every single scientific field had scientists engaged in COVID-19 research. And many uh, of these scientists performed model research, but even though they came from very, very different areas that had no tradition of modeling, and of course, no tradition of training in infectious diseases. Um, that's a paper that we published in PNAS, uh, where we described this massive covetization of the research landscape and the creation of a new citation elite, much of that driven by modeling and by studies that um, were speculative or, or clearly not experimental. Um, in, in fact, 98 of 100 most cited scientific articles published in 2020 were on COVID-19. So that came last. Uh, it, it came with the benefit of having lots of minds working on important problems, and uh, many of them bringing technology and skills from uh, different types of uh, modeling and different types of analysis. But also, it came at a cost of uh, low quality, no methodological quality, low rigor. Um, there's a lot of studies that we're performing a meta meta assessment at the moment, looking at quality of methodology and reporting and rigor of uh, COVID-19 uh, studies. And almost all of them have shown that the, the vast majority of the literature had modest or substantial problems. Why models in particular had problems? Um, as I said, they, they acquired uh, problems and uh, they were pretty much uh, ready to be used uh, on day one. Uh, conversely, other types of designs would have to take some time to get started. For example, an observational study would take time to collect data. A randomized trial would take months, if not years, to collect data and outcomes. But a model can be really uh, run uh, very quickly. And, and lots of very competent teams uh, try to run models. Uh, this is a case study of trying to see what happened, for example, with the predictions of some of the most experienced teams in terms of uh, what was going on in uh, New York State in real time, you know, trying to predict uh, COVID-19 daily deaths and ICU bed utilization during the first wave when New York was massively hit. Um, we identified a number of problems. First of all, even for deaths, which is like the, the most robust piece of data that one could have or should have, we saw that there was tremendous 
variability in different sources. Uh, what was the ground truth? You know, how many deaths had happened in the early days of the pandemic? Different sources for death counts gave different results. I'm showing you here the trajectories of the number of deaths with different sources of that ground truth. Um, that did get ameliorated downstream, but this is a challenge that we often have with lots of models that the, the ground truth uh, of what we enter in, in the model and what we try to forecast, for example, may be problematic. This is the error rate that uh, were observed, uh, the discrepancy between each model and the ground truth as measured by maximum absolute percentage error on the top and mean absolute percentage error at the bottom. Uh, you can see very, very high values. In, in fact, this is probably one of the best situations. New York State, unfortunately, was the one that was hit very, very hard. So, you know, any exaggerated prediction had a better chance of getting closer to, to that massive massacre that was happening compared with what was going on in other locations around the world. And, and this is showing in real time um, a prediction wave uh, in each day from March 25th uh, to um, uh, to June 5th, uh, uh, comparing ICU bed utilization, which is a, a very essential feature of what we want to be able to forecast reliably uh, so that we can know what's going to happen, whether our health system is going to be overwhelmed, whether we need to, to come up with more beds uh, to be allocated uh, in advance and, and so forth. And you see that very early on, the, the predictions are, are the, the shaded uh, areas there, they're way above uh, what happened, which is red, and also way above uh, uh, the capacity, which, which is uh, which is blue, which, which meant that that people thought that everything would, but actually it, it did not get overwhelmed. Of course, there's exceptions. There are some hospitals that were hit extremely hard. This is just one example, and and then we have to get broader considerations for why uh, forecasting. In infectious diseases and, and pandemics in particular can be very, very difficult. This is a paper that I wrote with uh, Sally Cripps uh, from uh, Sydney and, and Martin Tanner from Northwestern in, in Chicago for the International Journal of Forecasting. And we try to dissect a number of challenges that we face, especially we use modeling for forecasting. Uh, one major challenge is the poor data that we have to input on key features of the pandemic that uh, would go into the um, and also the poor data input for database forecasting. Uh, I showed you the data even for, for deaths, uh, not being very reliable sometimes. Uh, when it comes to other indicators, the error rate and the discrepancy from reality can be very, very substantial. Then we can have wrong assumptions in, in the models. For example, many models assume homogeneity or some very simplistic assumptions are being made that are not really uh, representative of what's happening in reality, where there might be a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of mixture problems that need to be recognized and incorporated in the model. Uh, estimates may be highly sensitive, and, and that may not be a note, especially if someone is fixed on a given narrative. We, it may be very easy to think that uh, one particular result is very well aligned with what we expect, and then we, we just run with that. Lack of incorporation of epidemiological features. Infectious diseases and epidemiology are kind of uh, in, a, in a broad hood, uh, but I think that one ignores the other very often. Uh, so you need strong mathematics, you need strong infectious disease knowledge, you need strong epidemiology knowledge. Most teams do not really have the ability to take care of all of these components. Very poor past evidence on effects of available interventions. Uh, COVID-19 is a classic example. We just didn't know how effective our interventions would be and how we should try to model this, how we should try to enter that into the calculations we had. Some evidence that was observational going back to the 1918 Spanish flu, almost before most of these fields started. So, so you know, very weak and very questionable on, on whether it really reflected what had really happened in 1918. Lack of transparency, very important, you know, not disclosed in sufficient details. Uh, many models were never formally peer reviewed, they were just presented and used by policymakers very quickly, and this is a plus, but you know, with, with no formal peer review. And the, the vast majority um, did not have everything in place, data, code, protocols, that someone could really rerun them again. Of course, many exceptions, and I will discuss that aspect in, in more detail. Errors are unavoidable. We will make errors. I, I think I'm a champion of making mistakes. I just try to go back and recheck my calculations all the time. Unless you have full transparency, 
um, it's not easy to detect all the errors that are being made. Lack of determinacy is a major debate for a long time in modeling. Uh, I can spend probably 50 hours on that. And importantly, looking at only one or a few dimensions of the problem. Um, many of these problems that we might be dealing, especially in a crisis and a pandemic, they deal with multiple aspects, not just uh, what the virus is doing, but what society is doing, what mobility is doing, what work um, environments are doing, what schools are doing, what uh, mental health is doing, and the health system and, and uh, access to care and so forth. It does need to be interact and it's very difficult to do. I said expertise in social disciplines. We had lots of people who want to uh, the band back and contributed, but that I think that we've got lots of unreliable modeling. Group thing and band can affect selective reporting, I believe in one outcome, um, and I get that outcome with one particular combination of results, that might be variable to report, and I will show you some examples and so forth. So I, I mentioned transparency as a key node in much of that, because with, with transparency, if everything is transparent, in theory, one could go back and see what exactly has happened and try to detect, is there selection bias? Um, what was the plan? Was it followed? Uh, what are the assumptions? So where's the code? Can I run it? Are there errors? What are the data? Are they reliable? Have they been updated? Uh, can I improve on them? So how much transparency do we have for infectious disease models, along with Emmanuel Zavalis, uh, who was uh, uh, visiting my team from Karolinska uh, last year, we did this uh, meta-epidemiological assessment looking at the models that had been published in 2019 and 2021. So recent work, uh, but one year just before the pandemic, and then uh, another year that uh, uh, goes uh, to uh, the core of, of the pandemic. And um, uh, these are traditional types of uh, models that are being used in infectious diseases and epidemiology, uh, compartmental models, time series, spatial temporal, agent-based, uh, or combinations thereof. Um, we saw a big uh, blast of COVID-19. Um, as you see, 2019, only 216 articles. 2021, 304 articles on non-COVID-19 topics. COVID-19 topics, 818 articles. You know, the, the vast majority of articles were on COVID-19. Other diseases were also represented in very different journals were represented in that sample. And these are the key transparency indicators. So overall, about 20% of models, 21.5%, shared their code. 24.8% uh, shared their data. 0.4% uh, were registered as protocols somewhere. Uh, almost all of them reported on conflicts of interest uh, and on funding. But, but actually, if you look very carefully, most commonly they said, no conflicts of interest to disclose, and uh, some did disclose funding. Many had no funding at all. There was not really much improvement from 2019 to 2021 in terms of code sharing, uh, data sharing, and uh, registration. The, the numbers, of course, are very thin. If anything, probably, as, except for code sharing, they go in the wrong direction. Uh, COVID-19 uh, did a bit better on code sharing, um, but not in other aspects. And when we look at uh, different types of models uh, uh, and uh, different types of uh, diseases and uh, uh, trying to see. There, there's some some differences, but not very major. And I think that uh, these deficiencies were uh, applicable both to COVID-19 and to other pathogens and uh, also were seen uh, across very different types of, of models. So for, for example, Agent Base did a little bit better on code sharing but the, the difference is not starting. It's 33.9% uh, versus 18, 19, 20% for the other models. Date, uh, these algorithms that we have developed in the past, uh, you can look at a paper we published uh, last year in PLOS Biology, looking at the entire scientific uh, uh, endeavor in terms of code sharing, data sharing, protocol registration, so forth. Um, Modeling has a little bit of, of a weird way of uh, saying that data have been uh, deposited somewhere. Uh, so maybe, Data were shared a bit more than what we saw with the automatic uh, text mining, but not much more. Uh, code sharing uh, slightly more, but not much. So in conclusion, most models uh, do not share their code and do not share their data. And, and hardly anyone have some protocol that is uh, registered somewhere. 
Uh, let me give you one example of what could go wrong if uh, uh, models uh, are non transparent uh, or if they're transparent enough so that you can see what can go wrong if they're not transparent. Uh, this is a paper that uh, I wrote with uh, Vincent Chin and Martin Tanner and Sally Cripps. Uh, and uh, we looked at probably the most famous model, the one by the Imperial uh, College team, uh, clearly an outstanding team, uh, one of the most experienced in the world. Uh, their model, uh, published in Nature, suggested that uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, uh, would uh, decrease in the first wave uh, the deaths uh, by about 3 million uh, just in, in Europe, just in a, in a handful of European countries. Uh, uh, amazing results. Um, uh, but we, we, uh, we were wondering how much it would be about that. And um, the, the reason for this was that the Imperial College team had used one particular model that uh, they had in the Nature paper. And at the very same time, they had developed a different model that uh, they had made uh, available uh, in, uh, in, in uh, online, and which they had applied not to Europe, but to the United States, to different states in the United States. So we said, what would happen if we take the model that it, the same developed for the United States states, and applied in Europe. There, there was no reason why not to do that. One is uh, also uh, uh, mobility. Uh, so you have a model that accounts uh, that does not account for mobility. You have a model that looks at mobility, which is model two, also by Imperial. We looked also at a model that accounts both for the combination of mobility and non-pharmaceutical interventions. And we tried to see what happens. And, and uh, this is uh, what these plots look like. Uh, the, this is uh, Italy, for example, with model one, without accounting for mobility, and uh, model two, looking at mobility. And you see different interventions, uh, which are the vertical lines. Uh, and you have social distancing, you have self-isolation, school closures, uh, public event ban, and lockdown. And they happen at different time points, but not really very far apart in terms of their timing. And there's different assumptions in terms of uh, what exactly is happening. So, so the first model is just saying, well, what happens right after, right the day that you apply uh, that particular uh, intervention? And model two is saying, well, let me take a look at the mobility and see how mobility changes and how the RT uh, for the basic reproductive number changes when I go ahead and apply the different measures. The, the conclusions are completely different. Um, model one would suggest that lockdown, as published in Nature, did save all these millions of lives. Model two would suggest that it saved no lives, practically. And uh, the reason for that is, is that the RT at the time that lockdown was applied was one or less than one in the vast majority of locations. There's one exception here, Belgium, that is pretty high, but in all the others. It's uh, pretty much one or close to one or even less than one. And uh, when you look at different metrics, uh, uh, for example, the uh, what an ABIAC key information criterion uh, and different variants and, and DIC, uh, and we looked at both up to May 5th, which was the original publication in Nature and with updated data up to July 12th, actually it was model two that was the one that had the best fit to the European data, not the one that was published in Nature. Um, if you extend to include some additional countries that were not reported in Nature, but they did have available data. For example, uh, three countries, Greece, Netherlands, and Portugal had available data. They were there, uh, but they were not reported. Actually, these model one performed very poorly and model uh, two performed again very well. And suggesting that RT was already one or less than one, Greece was 0.35, at the time of lockdown was uh, applied. So, you know, lockdown would have absolutely no benefit under these circumstances. This is looking at uh, RMSA, um, the, um, uh, the error rates, and uh, you see that both were up to May 5th and up to July 12th, practically model two outperforms uh, model one with very, very rare exceptions. Um, here's uh, another example where, where selective reporting uh, can be, uh, and, and uh, again, we have no transparency at all. It, it's not possible to say that, but, but if we have transparency, then uh, we can uh, ask uh, what's happened here. So in the case of the Nature paper, I think that, that we had two models. The best model was not reported. The one that was reported seemed to have one result that, that was completely different to what the best fitting model had. How about excess deaths? Excess deaths are 
also based on modeling, it's more simple modeling. Uh, basically, one needs to make assumptions about what is the, the period that uh, we are interested to predict uh, and compare the expected deaths versus the uh, observed deaths. And then there is the period based on which that prediction is made. So, you know, how many years are we taking into account and how are we modeling deaths in these previous years? Are we taking into account some sort of stratification? What kind of stratification for what kind of variables? How many years uh, do we assume that there's a linear trend? Do we assume that there's a spline? Do we assume that there's some steady state? Do we assume that do we want an ensemble model that builds different components of multiple models and so forth? So there have been multiple calculations of excess tests, which to me is like the, the easiest thing to, to do. It, it should be the easiest thing to do, to compare deaths in the pre-pandemic years versus deaths in the pandemic year. And this is uh, comparisons of two famous ones, one in The Lancet by IHME and one in eLife uh, uh, by two competent authors. I'm showing you here the ratio of the excess mortality over recorded COVID-19 deaths in The Lancet and the eLife practically there's no correlation if anything there's a negative correlation between the two why because the modeling assumptions are different and and they're transparent enough to see how they're different and and in some ways either or can be justified uh that they're reasonable choices but they give pretty different results uh, in countries that have very very rigorous data at least these are the 33 countries that are high income countries they have very good death registration. I'm not talking about what happened in uh, in Kenya or or India, where you know death registration. You have to be very speculative to make any sort of these calculations. I'm talking about countries like uh, France and Germany and uh, and US. Um, so along with Mike Levitt and uh, Francesco Zonda, we compared all the available calculations of excess mortality, and we also run our own based on what we thought <laughs> would be the, the best modeling approach, uh, looking at the uh, last year's pre-pandemic and uh, also taking a very rigorous age stratification, uh, because obviously the age structure of the population makes a difference. And if the age structure of the population changes, then you, you might see very big changes in the number of deaths uh, without having an infectious cause of pandemic or whatever uh, being responsible for them. So this is what it looks like. Um, three published modeling calculations, 2 million deaths for these 33 countries, 2.2 uh, million deaths with the economies that is not very transparent in their modeling, but very detailed in their data uh, presentation, results presentation. IHME, 2.8 million. Our modeling, 2.2 million. So somewhere in the middle of those without age adjustment, uh, but just 1.5 million deaths with age adjustment. And then WHO was somewhere in, in that vicinity as well. Um, astonishing discrepancies depending on how the modeling is being done. For example, our age adjusted estimate was 43,000 excess deaths. Without age adjustment, we calculated 17,000 excess deaths. Lancet calculated 203,000. eLife calculated 88,000. Economist calculated 113,000. Uh, Baum, also with age adjustment, went down to 22,000. Kennedy, without age adjustment, 130,000. And the recorded number were 111. So, you know, very subtle, seemingly subtle modeling choices can, can make a difference. But some of, of the choices, I think, are far more defendable than others. For example, in Germany, the number of people aged more than 80 years increased from 4.8 million in 2016 to 5.8 million in 2020. So, consideration of age, I think, is crucial. Any modeling that does not take that into account uh, would be highly, highly problematic. And unfortunately, many have not taken that into account. So who is right and, and who is wrong? Um, I don't know. <laughs> but I think that one way to uh, take care of this is to perform multiverse analysis. Multiverse analysis has been used in many other fields. Uh, I have used a, a collateral term that notes the same thing. I call it vibration of effects. What happens to results when you use a different set of assumptions or a different set of model choices? For example, you enter different variables in a multivariable uh, regression model. And we did that taking all the possible combinations of pre years and for projected years in the range of 2019, 2009 to 2019, and then 2019 to 2021. And this is average and the minimum and maximum. You see that there's very wide variability depending on what assumptions are being made. Uh, for example, for the first line for Australia, the average is minus 9.7, but it goes from minus 2.4 to minus 16.2. Uh, 
And this is looking at the average minimum and maximum across different countries. Quite substantial variability for specific years, but some consistency when you try to rank countries in some order of which one did best. Uh, for example, which countries did best during 2019-2021, the results for the exact numbers are very different depending on what assumptions are being made, but the winners are almost always the winners and the losers are almost always the, the losers. And, and you can see that this is the ranks that you get with all these different combinations of, uh, of pre-pandemic years uh, that you consider in the calculations. The United States was always a loser, and uh, South Korea was always a winner. Scandinavian countries were always winners, um, and uh, you know some of the Eastern European countries were always losers. There's some variability in terms of the ranking um, in some assumptions and in some combinations of pre-pandemic years. Uh, and of course, the absolute magnitude of the excess test would substantially vary, but the relative ranking of, of countries would be about the same. And also, if you expand the window of the projected period from just a single year, like 2020, 2021, to two years, 2020 and 21, to three years, 2019, 20 and 21, or four years, 2018 to 2021, the differences between different countries tend to shrink. You anticipate to see that, but uh, because you have a, a wider window, therefore, if one year is a bad year, it will tend to be diluted. But you can see also the relative dilution based on these multiple multiverse options across different countries. And in some countries, the dilution is very, very extensive. In some others, like the United States, there's not. So the United States have done very poorly, no matter how you want to see it, <laughs> no matter what assumptions one would make. I think that the United States did very, very bad. Um, one more aspect, data, um, data that go into the models. I started with the example about deaths and I, I looked at deaths in an early uh, first wave. Um, how about deaths now that we have far more mature information? Uh, can we rely on those? Well, even those need to make a lot of assumptions. For example, this is from a paper, a modeling paper that I published last year in the European Journal of Epidemiology, where I tried to look at what would happen to the number of recorded COVID-19 deaths uh, if different scenarios are applied in terms of how exactly testing is done, what is the background mortality, what is the infection fatality rate and so forth. And if you see color, that means that the real number of deaths is very different compared to the number of deaths that is recorded. And it could be both undercounted and overcounted under different uh, circumstances. And of course, if you enter that component in the calculation that adds another layer of variability. Uh, this means that I think that for many questions uh, need to be complemented with, uh, with observational evidence and even better with randomized evidence very early in the, the pandemic along with uh, Ioana Cristea and Floriano Dead, we made a plea to have randomized trials for COVID uh, social distancing interventions. Uh, we had wonderful randomized trials for treatments like uh, recovery and solidarity by WHO, but very little in terms of randomized trials that would inform better models uh, for non-pharmaceutical interventions. And finally, I, I want to discuss in the last couple of minutes uh, the possibility of registration. As I showed you in the meta-immunological assessment, there's very little registration of modeling happening. And, and of course, modeling is creative. Uh, a lot of modeling is happening iteratively. People try different possibilities and then they have some new idea and they go after that new idea. This is perfectly fine. And, and I think that it's not possible to pre-register the full string of events and choices and simulations modeling that will happen. But in some cases, it may be possible. And, and I wrote that paper in mathematical biosciences a few months ago, where I argue that for some aspects of modeling, we can have pre-registration. And I, I think that one has to balance the situations where pre-registration is favored and where pre-registration would be disfavored. Pre-registration would be favored with rigorous design uh, thought in advance with standardized procedures being preconceived, with optimal choices conceived in advance, with confirmatory research, with outcome performance evaluation, for example, forecasting. Forecasting, I think, should be pre-registered so that people would know. And we have examples, for example, the U.S. Forecasting Hub and the, the German Polish uh, Forecasting Hubs and others. Those can be separated into specific steps. Each one of them can be uh, pre-registered and data are to be collected prospectively. Conversely, if the design procedures are to be discovered, if the optimal choices are completely unknown, if it's all exploratory, if there's no outcome or performance evaluation, if the projects are chaotic, even to specify the steps in existing 
data are, are used. And I think that pre-registration makes little or no sense. There's both advantages and disadvantages. I think that what we try to do here is increase trust in research work. We, we try to get more objective assessment of model performance, decreasing the possibility of bias and manipulation of results and inferences, making research visible in public earlier, reduction of redundancy in research efforts, better overall research agenda, and allowing to claim early credit for scientific work and ideas. And of course, there's some disadvantages. We need to streamline the process so that this doesn't take extra work. Uh, of course, we need to avoid fake pre-registration where registrations happen after the study was actually done and over optimism that quality and efficiency of research uh, would improve. It's not so easy to improve uh, research massively. Nevertheless, uh, we need to come up with models that inform decision-making. Uh, and uh, these models need to be multidimensional. They, they need to look at multiple dimensions and multiple outcomes and to think a little bit out of the box in terms of what exactly is taken care uh, within the model. Uh, we need to do that because uh, there is a cascade of, of different effects that, that can happen. Uh, and uh, unless we take into account the, the full cascade of effects, I think we will be modeling just a sub phenomena rather than the scientific phenomena. To conclude, models are here to stay. I, I think that uh, I, I love models and I want to continue doing modeling. <laughs> I'm not going to abandon ship just because uh, we have difficulties. Uh, I'm sure that I'm talking uh, to people who love models uh, in this audience. They can be valuable. I think that they can be informative. We can get insights very fast. We can get insights actually for things that would happen in the remote future sometimes. Improvements are possible at the level of data input, at the level of transparency, at the level of relevance real life value pre-registration when applicable. meta assessments can offer an observatory of how models perform and also form a basis for possible interventions to further improve them. I think that we can think of research studies that focus on intervening on how modeling research is done. And I'm completely open to suggestions on how that could be both effective, efficient, and uh, fun to do. With many thanks uh, for all of you uh, for being here and listening, and, and thanks to a number of colleagues, uh, both from Stanford and from uh, many, many other universities around the world who have joined forces with me in some of the work that I showed to, uh, with you, uh, showed to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. Very. So I would like to ask the people to raise their hand. And uh, so uh, I see Angela first. So uh, please, Angela, you can you can ask your, your question. Uh, sorry, this was just a, a clapping hands. <laughs> ah, <laughs> OK. Who are the other one? Let's see. Uh, I'm trying to. Uh, I see Luke Oz, if I'm correct so I have a, please ask your question see, I have a question what is the, the origin of the excellency of the US work in predicting the mortality rate is uh, the origin of researchers for example the studies have been made uh, in majority in national laboratory and IH US Army etc or uh, in uh, universities or in uh, uh, private uh, uh, companies? Or, uh, well, what, what is the reason of this uh, uh, excellence in, in, in your, in your uh, uh, prediction of the mortality? Uh, I, I think that you know this is uh, pretty much what we see. And I, I believe that uh, at, at a minimum, the, the total number of deaths uh, should be reliable. But, but uh, what we see in the US uh, is that uh, compared to almost uh, every single other high-income country, uh, mortality had improved, life expectancy had expanded in the last 10 years in almost every single high-income country, except the United States. You know, so, so the United States seems to have some chronic problems of public health, you know, and I think that they're, they're multifactorial, they're related to access to care. We have a large segment of the population who are not insured. We have a large segment of the population Advantage. We have problems with inequalities, with marginalized populations. With uh, so, so the U.S. is not a single country. I think it's it's a it's a combination of a very wealthy country and uh, and an African country in, in a sense in terms of the, the healthcare and the background. We have a, a major problem with ongoing epidemics of uh, 
of opioids and drug overdose and uh, and to violence uh, and, and and others. So so I, I think that when you have all these dysfunctions uh, and you have a crisis like a pandemic, you you may see an exaggeration of of that crisis when the system is perturbed uh, even more. Uh, that, that's my best guess. Uh, you know, we see some of that also in in many Eastern European countries that were also having very problematic healthcare systems. You know going through a period of, uh, of austerity. We saw that in Greece that also went through very heavy austerity. You, you have perhaps to... The uh, Jacques, 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 could you ask just one question? Thank okay, you. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, look, look House, please, uh, please ask your question. If I'm pronouncing your... So all that, unmute, uh, right. So I was... I was wondering a little bit about the basis of these, uh, 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 for instance, the COVID deaths. We have uh, uh, in Germany, as you might know, we have the uh, Office of uh, Statistics who is publishing, but with a long delay, which is uh, very unfortunate, uh, the, the number of COVID deaths who are accidental uh, 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 infections. And uh, unfortunately, also these are not uh, are not uh, uh, published separately for the different uh, age groups, and there is a huge difference that you can uh, uh, indirectly uh, get out of uh, the uh, uh, the data from the uh, Robert Koch Institute. So for the younger people, uh, actually, the vast majority of COVID deaths. Uh, they gone, for instance, in, in, uh, at first in the age group uh, uh, 10 to 20, uh, are no COVID deaths at all. For the older uh, age groups, this looks completely different. So, I mean, uh, how do you take that into account? Just, just this, this kind of thing. This is a very, very crucial observation. And I, I have noticed the same. I've, I've looked at data from many different countries and their quality in terms of, uh, of whether they really reflect COVID deaths, I think varies tremendously. Uh, so you can look at the end product, which is excess deaths. And when you look at excess deaths, practically in the pandemic years, there was no excess deaths for, for children and young adults uh, in almost any high income country. I think that US is again, one exception. Uh, even the US in, in children, I think that there was death deficit. Um, and most likely that means that uh, the, the COVID-19 deaths that have been recorded there are, are not COVID-19 deaths. You know, they're, they're kind of with COVID-19. Uh, there's some autopsy studies, but not much. Uh, we've, we've done some uh, in-depth medical record assessment with some colleagues in different countries. Again, we see that, that many of the deaths are not really COVID-19 deaths. In other age groups, it's different. Uh, and I, I think that one cannot generalize across all countries. But th this, this means that one has to be very, very careful. Uh, and as I showed you that slide with the color, with the over and underestimation of deaths, you, you expect to see under some circumstances, tremendous overestimation. And in some other cases, you expect to see underestimation of, of COVID-19 deaths. So uh, taking just a single number and putting it in a model without taking into account that uncertainty can lead to some very conclusive conclusions that should not be as conclusive as, as, as they sound, uh, because, you know the data are are more brittle. They're they're more fragile uh, compared to what they look at at the surface. Okay, so, Quentin, please uh, ask your question. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, you you talked about the concept of uh, pre-registration, uh, which is uh, well, I, I have a vague notion of what it is, but uh, how how does that precisely would uh, would be organized? Is there a central authority that uh, you should register your model to? Or? So, so I think that the, the modeling community has to decide what would be efficient to do because for some types of designs like clinical trials, pre-registration is sine qua non. Uh, there's organized registers like clinical trials gov and the WHO registry and, and so forth. So people know that unless they pre-register what they're going to do, when they finish the trial, no major journal is going to accept to publish it. Uh, it for modeling, this is, probably a noble idea. And as I said, much of the modeling is so speculative and explorative. But for things like for, uh, there are already some models that are pre-registered. Uh, there's hubs of multiple modelists in the US and in Germany, who's in a way, I, I try to simplify this. They say, uh, these are my predictions for the next two weeks. Okay, I, I put them up on, on a 
on a file. Uh, it's data stamp, date stamped, and uh, the others do the same. And, and now two weeks later, we go back and we say, oh, so this is what we said, and this is really what happened. This is one sort of pre-registration. You know, so someone has made transparently a claim that this is what my model says, and this is what 10 other models say. And now that we see the results, we can go back and correct our models, improve our models, create an ensemble with differential weighting of, of the different models. It has to be seen on a case-by-case -case basis, but I think once we see more such uh, initiatives, I, I think we will start seeing more standardization in the field. Car currently, this is a rare exception. As I showed you, there's only five papers out of all these uh, 1,400 papers that we looked at that uh, had pre-registration of any sort. Thank you. Thank you. Um, James, please uh, ask your question. Slightly off the topic, are the reports of deaths caused by vaccination. Now these numbers tend to be very small, but play a big role in, for example, some of my relatives thinking as to whether or not they should get vaccinated. And sometimes the reported deaths occur months after the initial vaccine. It's plausible, but what do you think of these numbers? Oh goodness, we we, we can uh, discuss that for uh, for five years, <laughs> and uh, not I believe it. To conclusion, I I you know I, I I'm I'm a, a bit of a base in here, and I I think that um, uh, I I don't think that there's a problem of of, of all these excess tests being attributed to vaccines. I, I think that this is uh, an exaggeration. I don't think that that's the case. I think that vaccines save lives rather than kill people. We have clear examples of some side effects, both with mRNA and other vaccines that resulted in syndromes that result in deaths. They're not that common. Um, now, pharmacopidemiology has problems, we know that, in order to detect modest differences for common uh, outcomes. So, you know, we, we have a 5% relative risk uh, uh, increase uh, in some major outcome. This will not be easy to document and this will not be easy to refute. Um, do I believe that that's the case? Probably not. Do I believe that we need better data? Yes, we do. I mean, we just need to continue collecting data and see what happens. Um, but, but pharmacopidemiology, we know, is, is, is a tool that has some limitations. It, it's never gonna be perfect. And, and especially in a crisis setting and in a setting where people have very strong beliefs that vaccines are killing them or vaccines are perfect, uh, you know, that, that's not going to be so easy to settle. But I, I personally think that um, uh, we should just keep collecting data <laughs> and not panic. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Andrea, please. Well, um, very, very thoughtful talk. And we as a modeling community are producing models by the thousands. And, and as you mentioned, uh, there was an epidemics of modeling during the COVID epidemics. Uh, do we, can we offer non-modelers, the, 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 the people to whom our models ought to be useful, some reasonable uh, criteria for assessing whether a model is good or bad? Some, is there an agenda in which we can uh, at least give some level of quality uh, certification to some kinds of models which are widely employed? That, that's an excellent comment. I, I, I think that this can be done. I, I think that it's up to the modeling community to, to give a sense of the level of certainty and uncertainty surrounding some of the estimations being provided, especially for policy decisions. Um, I think many of these estimates should come with a grain of salt. So it's, it's an art of communication, you know, science communication and policy communication that Unfortunately, we as scientists were not really trained to, to do. You know, so so I, I, I'm not trying to blame here anyone. <laughs> Whenever I try to communicate to, to uh, someone who's not a scientist, I, I start saying, oh my goodness, now I'm mumbling. What am I saying? <laughs> what, what will that person get from what I'm trying to say here? Uh, so we need to get the best modeling, uh, the best science communication, the best policy to science interaction and come up with some mutual understanding. That, that's not how things went wrong. Uh, I think we can use these examples to build some better understanding in the future, hopefully. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the last question, I think uh, we will stop here. So clo 
Klaus Croy, if I'm pronouncing it well. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you um, for the nice talk and also for being a lighthouse uh, throughout the last few years for many of us um, with your work and with your um, stringent um, work in particular on, on all these topics. I want to follow up on a question that Stefan Luckhaus asked. He asked for the age heterogeneity and how to deal with that. And I want to extend this and say it's not only age, it is immunological response. It is, um, it is uh, you know, I mean, spatial structures. It is mobility structures. There's a lot of heterogeneity. There's genetic heterogeneity and so on and so on. So we have so many heterogeneities and we have strong nonlinear interactions. And then the question is how well does such a phenomenon um, yield to coarse-grained modeling and all the modeling that is really done is, is coarse-grained modeling in particular in, in, in terms of these what we call modeling right um, these um, analytical models that sometimes are solved numerically of course but but essentially they are very coarse-grained um, low-dimensional models and um, we know from other phenomena like weather forecasts you can't forecast the weather for 40 days you simply can't right and you even though we have thousands of weather stations all over all the airplanes flying around have weather recording and and so we have a, a super uh, dense meshwork of measurement points and and we are measuring simple things and we know the underlying equations exactly we know the physics of the phenomenon all this is not true for um epidemiology so the question is how much uh, do you think there is evidence that some aspects, at least, of this phenomenon coarse grain well enough to make these models really reliable and meaningful? That, that's, that's a very deep question, and, and I, I sympathize with you that, that um, uh, we, we need some humility that, that these are very, very heterogeneous settings. And uh, especially in the beginning, we knew nothing about the heterogeneity then as we acquire some background knowledge, we can start building some of the heterogeneity in the modeling. And I think that once we know about different sources of heterogeneity, these should be taken into account in the models. For example, you know, age is, is a sine qua non because we're talking about differences in risk of, of more than 10,000 fold. Uh, so, you know, they cannot be ignored. But other things like genetics, mobility, uh, circumstances, socioeconomic and, and so forth can also be included. If we cannot include them, or if we include them with tools and with measures and, and with data that are suboptimal, I think whatever outcome comes out of the model should have more uncertainty associated with it than the uncertainty that we see. So, so we should be extra cautious in saying that, uh, well, we see that much uncertainty, but maybe we need to uh, expand it and uh, have more humility about what that model can tell us. I would not abandon modeling because of heterogeneity. I, I would say it's it's an opportunity to to try to improve what we do, but just a knowledge that sometimes we can only go that far. Okay. So thank you very much, and uh, um, so it's time to close the webinar today. Uh, a million thank you for this very interesting uh, presentation and discussions. And um, okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.